Welcome, it's Monday, and it is June the 8th, and it's fireside chat time with a little bit of uh, a surprise, a good surprise today. Pastor Bill typically will do Communion Fridays on fireside chats, but he's going to be sharing today, and then Chase will do uh, this Friday, just this week, and he'll do Communion with you and, and bring the chat for you uh, on Friday. Uh, but today, as always, a timely word uh, in, in the times that we live and the crisis we face. And so uh, Pastor Bill is going to take it from here. So let's uh, strap in and, and tune in to what the Lord would speak to us. Bill? Yeah, thank you, Alan. Thank you so much for spearheading this and keeping us on track. And I want to thank Chase for flipping his schedule with me. You know, the, I just noticed this. The table that we do this at, one of the tables, the stand-up table, is uh, it's kind of iconic for us as a church. Uh, some of you might have been with us when we were meeting outside in the park in, uh, at Huntington Central Park 15 years ago, right at this time, from May all the way through August, 15 years ago, on, in 2005, we were outside. And one of the things that we did during that time, we were, we were doing a study through um, the book of Joshua, and we called it the crossing because we were crossing over from one place to a new place. God was changing our name. And at, at one uh, Sunday, we had this deal where we were talking about the stones of remembrance that um, the people of Israel were told. Each tribal member took a large stone and they picked it up out of the river and they took it out of the river and put it on the Jordan side of the, the banks of the river to remind them of uh, what God had done in the crossing over. And so we took all these little stones and we told the people right on there what God is doing in your heart. And, and this table is one of those that has those stones embedded in the top of it. And it really has something to say about what I want to talk about today, that we are all in process. We are all learning new things and we're all hopefully moving forward in our walk with Jesus and becoming a brighter and brighter light, <laughs> a witness for him, a candle in the darkness. But I want to say this, and uh, this is the reason that I asked to be um, put into the schedule today, right away following the weekend. This weekend I spoke six times. Five of those were our typical weekend meetings, and then I was on the schedule to speak for the Sunday evening meeting as well. So six times, and let me tell you, that's a lot of words, a lot of words. And my message was based in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 18 through chapter 3, verse 9. And here's just the themes. They were talking about the dynamics between a master and a servant or a slave. And that, that's a tough thing to speak about in, a, in any time, certainly. But we put that in the context of, of when that happened and what it meant to be in submission that way. We talked about the dynamic between a husband and a wife, mutual submission to build a wonderful family. And then the dynamic both in the family of God as well as the global human, human family that we're all a part of. You can really say this very uh, accurately that any human being that's alive is in one degree your brother or your sister. We are all made, as the scripture says in Acts chapter 17, verse 26, God made from one blood all mankind, all humanity, all of the nations. So we're all related to one another. But the title of the message was Marching Like Jesus Marched. And I wasn't trying to be clever. I was just drawing the, the comparison between, yes, the marches that are happening you know, in our streets and the fact that Jesus has called us to march for him. In 1 John, and John who was a good buddy of, of Peter's, he said, those who say they dwell in Christ and they dwell in God, they live in him and him in them, really ought to walk like Jesus walked. And we talked about how to march like Jesus marched. And, and today, as I said, there's, there's an awful lot of, of uh, marching going on. And in the marching, there's a lot of shouting, sometimes a lot of screaming, there's a lot of defending of opposing positions and there's a lot of division and even at times sadly there's been violence and there's been bloodshed and, and there's been the sacrifice of life or the taking of lives and I spoke directly about those demonstrations as well as the riots and the violence that we've seen in our streets and I called the church this church anyone who listens to my voice to take the lead in the fight today against racism and against prejudice, however, however deep you think it is or however superficial you think it is, to be a voice and a presence for love and peace and understanding. And then I spoke about the tipping point that seems to have given rise to both the peaceful protests and the marches and the demonstrations 
as well as that terrible, violent, and illegal, and destructive, and deadly rioting, and vandalism, and looting that we've seen. And it's it just sad, and it's heartbreaking to see all of that at a time when, when voices are being raised that I believe need to be raised and listened to. And the tipping point seems to have been the horrific killing of George Floyd in South Minneapolis, which followed on the heels of the death of two other African Americans, Ahmad Asbury in Georgia and uh, Breonna Taylor in, and I, I'm, it, it's, oh, in Kentucky, in Kentucky. And, um, and, and I showed pictures during the service of all three of those. And here's why I did. I showed the pictures because I think we need to remember what, what followed or, or what, what led up to the demonstrations and, and all that we've seen. And to remember that those, those were simply our brothers and our sister who lost their lives there. And, uh, and so I showed those photos and I did not raise my voice at any time in support of the Black Lives Matter organization because you know quite honestly I don't know enough about the organization that, that, that is, is forcing that forward and, and maybe it's wonderful I hear many people say that it's not a wonderful at the organizational level but I know that it has been used by many people to raise their voice and, and I support them in their raising the voice what I did do is I did call believers who choose to carry a sign or make a social media post, another form of a public sign, to make sure that they also take another step, that we take another step, a very important step, and don't just carry the sign or post the post, but be the sign. Be a sign of love and unity and support in our, in our culture right now. And yes, especially along with other issues that are big at this time, but also to stand in support of those who have suffered unfair treatment for no other reason but the color of their skin or their nationality. Shortly after the conclusion of my, my weekend talking six times, uh, actually after the fifth one, shortly after that, I began to receive texts and emails and voice messages from some who were very concerned and very disappointed about my weekend message. And I need to say this absolutely sincerely. I am very thankful for each voice, not just because they said what they said, but the way they said what they said. I, I'm very profoundly thankful for their courage in speaking to me and, and getting their message across to me. So th I, I want to thank Jan and Michelle and Scott and Vic and Jason and Thomas and Marika. Long conversation with a couple of folks there. But Proverbs 27, 17, and here's why I'm so thankful. It says this, that as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. And the result of the conversations and the exchange of emails and such has been very, very sharpening to me. It's helped me some, to see some things far more clearly. And I needed the input of my brothers and sisters who had the courage, and I would say the love to speak to me. The love for the Lord and the love for their church and the love for their pastor to speak to me about their disappointment and about their concern. And the Bible has much to say to those who have a calling to speak for God like I have. Um, and I tell you, I see it as a very, very high call. And I also see it as a dangerous calling because this is true uh, in many, many ways. You can, with your words, you can do so much with your words. You can build up, you can tear down. You can, you can bring great comfort or you can bring great harm or confusion. You can be called by God to say things that are uncomfortable to hear but necessary to hear. And I believe that my message on the weekend had some of that in it, maybe a lot of that in it. Things that were difficult for some people to hear. I want you to hear what James said to people like me and anybody who takes up the, the word of God to speak it to other people. Now, there should be some trembling when we do that. Here, listen to this. It's in the third chapter of James, and James said, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. That's enough to tremble. But he says, he goes on, he says, For we all stumble in many ways, in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man. Let me tell you, I am certainly not a perfect man. And it, but if he doesn't stumble in his words, oh, he's able to bridle the whole body. He got everything under control. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look at the ships also. Although they are so large and driven by fierce winds, they're turned by very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. And even so, the tongue 
is a little member and boast great things. <laughs> it's appropriate we have this candle here today. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. He goes on to talk more about that. Well, I have looked back at the encouragement of, uh, after, after listening to um, the voicemails and, and reading the, the emails and the text messages, I've looked back at, at the message from last weekend and I've come to a conclusion. My conclusion is this, that our Saturday night gathering and Sunday morning gatherings, we're so happy to be back in the house together with one another here. But those messages, those morning services, during those services, I did deliver a message from God's Word. And I'm not ashamed at all of what I said. But here's the other side of the story. I only delivered a half of a message. Maybe more accurately, 75 to 85 percent of a message of what should have been said that morning. See, when speaking about the current social upheaval, there are many, many talking points and many different sides and issues that really do need to be discussed. The cry for justice and righteousness is one. I put up on the screen this weekend the passage from Amos chapter 5, verses 23 and 24 that Martin Luther King quoted from is one, in one of his iconic speeches. He says, take away the noise of your songs, God said to his people. I'm tired of your music, he said. I will not hear the melody of your stringed instruments. And then he said, instead, let justice roll down like water and righteousness like a mighty river. There's the, the need to talk about the cry for justice and those who are oppressed, in, in, even in our culture, or feel that they are oppressed, and to listen to them speak. There's also the right to demonstrate and to march and to speak your voice loud and clear and peacefully. And then there's the need for this to be done, like I, I said, in an appropriate manner, peacefully. And then there's the need to stand against the violence and the crime and the murder in our streets and in our neighborhoods, wherever that comes from, whatever source that comes from. And the respect for the authorities who have been called by God to defend and to protect. Now, I don't, I don't retract anything that I said from this last weekend. I don't retract anything. I do sincerely and profoundly regret what I did not say this weekend, which was the cause of concern for a good handful of people. And, you know, they tell us for every one person that writes a letter or makes their thoughts known to you, there's probably, who knows the math, eight to ten others that just say, I'm done. And I, my heart breaks for those who would say that maybe, maybe refuge is not a safe place to be. I regret what I did not say. I can't believe how badly yesterday, I really sincerely did, I dropped the ball in one very, very strong and important way to speak for 45, 50 minutes on the topic that I did and not say one solid, cohesive word or statement in direct support of our police officers and all of our law enforcement agency from administration on down to the men and women that are on the street foot you know step after step the beat cops that are in our our neighborhoods to not give one solid supportive statement to the police and those that are have been sworn to 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 defend us and protect us and to keep the peace that was a, an egregious miss on my part as i said metaphorically in sports terminology, I definitely dropped the ball. And for that, I, I deeply apologize. I have no excuse for that. I, I'm still trying to figure out how did I not, in, the, in the, the, the time that I spent preparing, realize it might be good to say thank you to those people that have kept these protests from becoming more unruly or more deadly. How did I not bring up the the name of, of the, the, the 34, 35-year veteran black officer who, who was gunned down and, and left to die and filmed in his dying by a criminal on the street. How did I not speak in support of those who stand on the line every day and as they stand out there, they are being shouted at, they're being called horrible names, they're being spit at, rocks are being thrown at them whether it's the police or the, or the military that's been called in, how could I have not said that? I don't retract anything that I said about the existence of racism in our world today. And whether we think you or I see it differently, whether we think that it is systemic and widespread, or whether we think it's residual and on the way out, it is still alive, it is still there. And if we think that it's not there, if I think it's not there, then I need to wake up 
because I'm not looking clearly. I'm not seeing it clearly. I'm not paying attention. And so I, I want to apologize to our police officers and our law enforcement agencies and to the military who have stood up. These, these men and women are working long hours. Back, some are back-to-back -back shifts. They're 12 on and 12 off and no days off in between while they keep peace. And I just want to pray for them right now. I want to pray for them and pray for our community as we walk through this time. These could be the times that divide us severely as a nation or the times when we unite as a nation. And I believe that God has raised up his church for such a time as this to be the presence of healing in this world, to speak truth, all the truth, the uncomfortable truth that needs to be heard at times. And I want to be that person. But I want to be a voice for unity. I want to be a voice for, for justice and for righteousness and for healing and for comfort. And I say thank you again to those of you who brought this to my attention and to those who will contact me from this point on. I'll respond to everything that I, is, I find in, 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 due, in due time. Trust me, I will. But I want to pray for us and pray for our nation at this time. And, and by the way, many of you know this has spread around the world now. And I've heard of, uh, of New Zealand and Australia and the UK and other places in, I think, in, in Europe. I'm not sure if up in Canada as well, but it's spreading. And let's let the voice be raised peacefully and consistently for righteousness and justice and let it roll down from us in the way we treat folks. But Father, I want to praise you for your, your patience with us, Lord. Thank you for teaching us. Thank you for leading us. And God, I want to pray that over, over these, these uh, protests, these demonstrations, Father God, that, that as voices are raised, may they continue to be raised peacefully with hearts open for solutions, as difficult as it may be to find those solutions. Would you walk us as a nation and as communities as men and women, forward to the solution of love that will really change everything. No law is going to change racism. No law is really, really going to stop evil. But it's only love that will, Father. So let us be purveyors of love and hope and respect. And we pray for your protection over those who have been sworn to protect us, Father. Thank you for these men and women who have laid their lives on the line and stand forward to protect, not knowing what they're going to get every single day. Would you bless them, Father God? Would you continue to use them? As you say in your word, they're agents of your kingdom, and let them be upstanding, solid, righteous agents, Father, as they step into these communities today. And we commit this time to you, Lord, of our crisis. Would you walk us through this in Jesus' name? Amen. I have to say this. I got this from a friend. Thank you, LaShawn, for sending this to me. It says, uh, Sean said, a good friend reminded him today, and yet this would be yesterday or today, I guess. A good friend reminded me today that Jesus is not about confusion, but Satan is on a mission to bring division within the church and within the world. And I think we need to remember that, that we are fighting a battle, a spiritual battle. Let's fight it with spiritual weapons of love and truth and prayer. May the Lord bless you as you walk forward during this time, and let's bring unity into this confusion. In Jesus' name, God bless you. Grace and peace to you.